If you're new to my channel, or even if you've been watching my stuff for a while, you might find my channel a bit odd or confusing, which frankly is just the way I like it. Here you will encounter videos on philosophy, film analysis, art, painting, religion, K-pop, video games, history, literature, and a wee bit of science. All on one channel. You'll find videos meant to be taken seriously, others with a grain of salt. Some to be chuckled at, some to be wept at, and some to make you wonder. This odd assortment of topics is neither random nor accidental, and reflects far more than my erratic whims, or my desire to alienate any kind of regular audience. There is a specific purpose behind how I make each video, and this philosophy also undergirds the entire channel and binds all of the videos together into a unified vision. It's an idea that I call the empire of the mind. An empire is defined as a single supreme authority ruling over other distinct entities, usually states or countries, but sometimes simple spheres of activity. Think of Alexander's Macedonian Empire, one man ruling not just Macedon, but also Greece, the ancient Near East, and parts of Asia. Or think of the Roman Empire, one group of people and later one emperor ruling not just one city, not just Italy, but holding dominance over the entire Mediterranean. For me, the empire of the mind is the vision of one mind ruling over a vast and ever-expanding empire of ideas. One mind with many territories. Some of them very, very different from each other. And this is why in my video essays, you will often find me attempting to draw together a wide range of ideas, appealing to a wide range of thinkers, and connecting things that at first don't seem to have anything to do with each other. And this is why on the channel itself, you will find a wide range of topics covered. Part of this is simply the outflow of my curiosity and the manifestation of a personality that is extremely high in trait openness and very easily gets bored with familiar things. But for me, the empire of the mind is not just about my natural curiosity. It's also an ideal to strive for, a vision I haven't arrived at yet. It's not just that I enjoy learning widely, but I see a vision of what I could be if I continue to learn widely and lay this vision across my shoulders as an obligation. This vision has been fed by many tributaries over the years, one of them being the Roman philosopher Seneca. He had this vision of drawing together the ideas of different philosophers and annexing them to oneself. He wrote that the only persons who are really at leisure are those who devote themselves to philosophy, and they alone really live. For they do not merely enjoy their own lifetime, but they annex every century to their own. All the years that have passed before them belong to them. Unless we are the most ungrateful creatures in the world, we shall regard these noblest of men the founders of divine schools of thought as having been born for us and having prepared life for us. We are led by the labor of others to behold the most beautiful things which have been brought out of darkness into light. We are not shut out from any period. We can make our way into every subject. And if only we can summon up sufficient strength of mind to overstep the narrow limit of human weakness, we have a vast extent of time wherein to disport ourselves. We may argue with Socrates, doubt with Carneades, repose with Epicurus, overcome human nature with the Stoics, exceed it with the Cynics. Since nature allows us to commune with every age, why do we not abstract ourselves from our own petty, fleeting span of time and give ourselves up with our whole mind to what is vast, what is eternal, what we share with better men than ourselves? Seneca's language is thoroughly imperial here. He speaks of annexing the ages to ourselves as if an empire were annexing territory and 
not a small amount of territory either. Even in those days, the mere study of philosophy meant the study of just about everything under the sun and above it. To open the complete works of Plato alone is to encounter not just typical philosophical topics like epistemology, metaphysics, politics, justice, and ethics, but friendship, love, discipline, courage, Atlantean myth, rhetoric, and artistic inspiration. And if we took Plato's student Aristotle and made him the foundation for our education, you'd have to think through many of the things just mentioned, including logic, physics, meteorology, the nature of the soul, consciousness, and the life force of animals and human beings, memory, sleep, dreams, length and shortness of life, youth, old age, biology, the nature and means of attaining happiness, and poetry. While none of us will achieve the unique brilliance of Plato or Aristotle, they show us that it is possible for one person to think about all of these things all throughout his or her life. And in their writings, we have a map to begin us on that journey. In Seneca's words, they have prepared life for us. We are led by their labors to behold the most beautiful things which have been brought out of darkness into light. When we do think about a wide range of things, reading widely and thinking widely, and annexing these ideas to our minds, it has the curious effect of making a person seem larger. As C.S. Lewis said in his experiment on criticism, the reason why we read and the reason why I've made this channel is because we seek an enlargement of our being. We want to be more than ourselves. Each of us by nature sees the whole world from one point of view with a perspective and a selectiveness peculiar to himself. And even when we build disinterested fantasies, they are saturated with and limited by our own psychology. But we want to escape the illusions of perspective on higher levels too. We want to see with other eyes, to imagine with other imaginations, to feel with other hearts as well as with our own. We are not content to be Leibnizian monads. We demand windows. Literature as Logos is a series of windows, even of doors. And one of the things we feel after reading a great work is, I have got out. Or from another point of view, I have got in, pierced the shell of some other monad and discovered what it is like inside. We therefore delight to enter into other men's beliefs, those say of Lucretius or Lawrence, even though we think them untrue, and into their passions, though we think them depraved, like those sometimes of Marlowe or Carlyle, and also into their imaginations, though they lack all realism of content. This, so far as I can see, continues Lewis, is the specific value or good of literature considered as logos. It admits us to experiences other than our own. Those of us who have been true readers all our life seldom fully realize the enormous extension of our being which we owe to authors. We realize it best when we talk with an unliterary friend he may be full of goodness and good sense, but he inhabits a tiny world. In it, we should be suffocated. The man who is contented to be only himself, and therefore less a self, is in a prison. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see through those of others. Reality, even seen through the eyes of many, is not enough. I will see what others have invented. Even the eyes of all humanity are not enough. I regret that the brutes cannot write books. Very gladly would I learn what face things present to a mouse or a bee. More gladly still would I perceive the olfactory world charged with the information and emotion it carries for a dog. We want to live in a large world world. We are not content 
to be merely ourselves. We want to be more of a self, an enlargement of what I can only call soul. And that is not a word I use lightly. Plato's dialogue Phaedrus is ostensibly about rhetoric, but much of the discussion about speech making is framed around the topic, strangely, of love, since the speeches of the dialogue are on precisely that topic. And this, in turn, invokes a discussion of the soul. It's here that Plato creates his famous chariot analogy of a tripartite soul that is driven by two horses, passion and virtue, both of which should be ruled by the charioteer of reason. While the return to the topic of speech making might seem confusing and jarring after a lengthy discussion on love and the soul, we realize that there's a connection here, at least for Plato, when he writes, the nature of speech is in fact to direct the soul. Whoever intends to be a rhetorician must know how many kinds of soul there are. This dialogue is where Socrates famously criticized both writing and reading, because written treatises don't force us to memorize things, and so they weaken our memories. And so, in a sense, Socrates argued for developing one's memory, and it's a powerful rebuke to a modern age that remembers nothing. But in reality, Socrates was arguing for more than just memory. The actual terminology he uses is different. What he actually argues for is inscribing a living word on the soul, a living logos, a living message or discourse. He's arguing for knowledge, not just that you remember, but knowledge that is life, because it is part of one's soul, and it becomes active in you. And the reintroduction of the topic of the soul here brings back the crashing tide of everything that Socrates and Phaedrus had been discussing in the dialogue previously. Your knowledge is to be integrated into the act of charioteering the self, integrated into the inward phenomenological dance of passion, virtue, and reason. Whether you want to call that a soul, a mind, or a body, or whatever, your logos must be carved there. Only in principles of justice and goodness and nobility taught and communicated orally for the sake of instruction and graven in the soul, which is the true way of writing, is there clearness and perfection and seriousness, and that such principles are man's own legitimate offspring. The person who pursues this kind of living word in him or herself is to be called wisdom's lover, a philosopher. So the true lover of wisdom develops his or her soul. Thus the dialogue concludes with a prayer of Socrates to Pan and all other gods of this place, saying, Grant that I may be beautiful inside. Let all my external possessions be in friendly harmony with what is within. May I consider the wise man rich. This emphasis on the union of love and knowledge and virtue in the soul was strong enough to permeate Plato's works. In his dialogue on self-control, or sophrosune, he says, And the soul, my dear friend, is cured by means of certain charms. And these charms consist of beautiful words. It is a result of such words that temperance arises in the soul. And when the soul acquires and possesses temperance, it is easy to provide health both for the head and for the rest of the body. In his most famous and perhaps most ambitious work, known today as the Republic, Plato compares the lover of learning to the erotic lover. Just as the lover loves everything about the person he is infatuated with, someone who loves learning must above all strive for every kind of truth from childhood on. 
the lover of learning, neither loses nor lessens his erotic love until he grasps the being of each nature itself with the part of his soul that is fitted to grasp it, because of its kinship with it, and that, once getting near what really is, and having intercourse with it, and having begotten understanding and truth, he knows, truly lives, is nourished, and, at this point, but not before, is relieved from the pains of giving birth. Seneca, of course, as a Stoic, was interested in just this kind of philosophy, discovering how ideas can help us to truly live, how knowledge can become life, rather than merely gaining a new perspective or some kind of abstract truth, or asking pointless questions. He rejected speculative sophistry and wanted to know how do these ideas help me to live better. In his 88th letter to Lucilius, Seneca roundly criticized the liberal studies as being useless knowledge. At times seeming to contradict what he had said in his essay on the shortness of life, or perhaps maintaining a healthy dialectical back and forth between thesis and antithesis, Seneca says that the liberal studies, by and large, are quite a waste of time, in that they will not make a man a better person. Mathematical studies like geometry, the scientific studies like astronomy, and yes, even the study of literature that resonates with me so much in the words of C.S. Lewis, even that, according to Seneca, is dispensable. Such studies may pave the way for an excellent moral character, according to Seneca, though it seems to me that he doesn't make it clear how they do so. His point, at any rate, is that such preparatory studies can't give us virtue itself. That only comes from the study of wisdom. Ultimately, Seneca's attitude toward education is perhaps best summarized in his 108th letter, when he writes, my advice is really this, what we hear the philosophers saying and what we find in their writings should be applied in our pursuit of the happy life. We should hunt out the helpful pieces of teaching and the spirited and noble-minded sayings which are capable of immediate practical application, not far-fetched or archaic expressions or extravagant metaphors and figures of speech, and learn them so well that words become works. In any case, I hate everything that merely instructs me without augmenting or directly invigorating my activity. These words are from Goethe. So writes Friedrich Nietzsche in his essay on the use and abuse of history. And you can see my three videos on that essay if you want to know more. But for this essay, that one-liner I just quoted sums up pretty well my view of education. I've long been haunted by Kierkegaard's magnum opus and all-around intimidating book concluding unscientific postscript. It's a difficult book to understand, but it's filled with sentences and paragraphs that have had a powerful impact on my life, unlike any other book in philosophy. A Kierkegaard scholar, biographer, and translator Alistair Haney writes, If we follow Kierkegaard's own pointer, then postscript can be read as offering a non-philosophical notion of the unified and concrete personality. What postscript provides is an itinerary for the path to personality. That, at least, is one interpretation. And such an interpretation seems to jive well with the chapter in postscript on what Kierkegaard calls the subjective thinker, who Unlike the abstract, objective thinker, who is a professorial figure who never relates his abstract thought to his existence as an actual human being, merely reciting information like a parrot, the subjective thinker, by contrast, is inspired in his thinking and impassioned in his thought, because he is concerned with human existence. And it is impossible to think about human existence without becoming passionate. So the subjective thinker is not a scholar, he is an artist. To exist is an art. 
The subjective thinker is aesthetic enough for his life to have aesthetic content, ethical enough to regulate it, and dialectical enough to master it in thought. And the subjective thinker's task is to transform himself into an instrument, a, a musical instrument, that clearly and definitely expresses the human in existence. And therefore, the subjective thinker, unlike the objective thinker, makes himself a work of art and lives the richest possible life. All of these influences have driven me to give a practical bent to my videos, as much as possible. I don't just want to regurgitate fun facts or provide infotainment, because for me, a frozen, objective awareness of facts without a change of life is a betrayal of existence. I don't agree with all of the ideas I discuss, and in fact, I think a lot of people mistakenly assume I condone every idea I talk about simply because I entertain them. I don't condone them all. I'm often driven simply by C.S. Lewis's view of literature as logos, simply to step as fully as I can into ideas, even ideas with which I disagree, in order to inhabit a larger world. And on top of that, I'm driven by Nietzsche's idea that the errors of great men are more fruitful than the truths of little men. I'm driven to try and find, even in those ideas with which I disagree, something practical, something I can use to better myself and anyone else who will listen. Either way, I want to get down to the marrow of life, even if it's in a film or music analysis. I want to weave a breeze that wafts, if ever so subtly, in the direction that one should sail. For me, the empire of the mind is not about mere instruction or learning, but about living better, living more, and becoming more yourself. An empire involves power and rule, and at the very bottom, Power is nothing more than ability and capability about potential and actuality. And the empire of the mind seeks greater ability and potential and actuality through ideas. The more powerful car drives faster and the more powerful storm wreaks more havoc. And after all, a genius, says Kierkegaard, is like a thunderstorm. They go against the wind, terrify people, and cleanse the air. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote that we are weary of gliding ghost-like through the world, which is itself so slight and unreal. We crave a sense of reality, though it come in strokes of pain. We desire to be made great. We desire to be touched with that fire which shall command this ice to stream and make our existence a benefit. There is indeed a connection between feeling our substantiality, feeling more real, and becoming a benefit to other conscious beings. And my mental empire seeks the power to make my life a benefit. If Plato argued in his Republic that every king, every guardian should be a philosopher, I think that every philosopher should be a king insofar as a king is as the Greek philosophers defined him, a person who has power to do good to others and does do good for them. John Milton makes mention of an ancient sect who, he says, taught that every good man is a king. And even Plato was getting at something like this, I think, in his dialogue Losus. Even in the nitty-gritty of everyday life, gaining knowledge frees us from other people and gives us power over them for their good. He writes, Then now, my dear Lucis, you perceive that in things which we know, everyone will trust us, Hellenes, barbarians, men and women, and we may do as we please about them, and no one will like to interfere with us. 
we shall be free and masters of others. And these things will be really ours, for we shall be benefited by them. And therefore, my boy, if you are wise, all men will be your friends and kindred, for you will be useful and good. Every intellectual, a king, even an emperor, working for the good of the people, walking in the market and attracting even the young. And to be plausibly accused of corrupting the youth, a philosopher has not only to speak in terms that even the young will understand, and in ways that make the greatest things compelling to the least of these, but he has to actually change them, which is the element of corruption. And this is what Socrates was accused of. Socrates' words amaze and possess the souls of every man, woman, and child who comes within hearing them. In frustration, Alcibiades grits his teeth and says, I have been bitten by a more than viper's tooth. I have known in my soul, or in my heart, or in some other part, that worst of pangs. More violent in ingenious youth than any serpent's tooth, the pang of philosophy, which will make a man say or do anything. Socrates spent his days among ordinary people talking about what seemed to be everyday things. Kierkegaard wrote that Socrates always talked only about food and drink, but basically he was always talking about and always thinking about the infinite. Socrates is thought to have been so popular and one hears a lot of excited babbling about this. Nonsense, writes Kierkegaard. All that about walking and talking with shoemakers and tanners, etc., was ironically directed against the academic philosophers, and it amused him that it appeared as if they spoke the same language, he and the shoemaker, because they used the same expressions. But Socrates understood something entirely different by it. And it's this ever-present duality in the character of Socrates that seems to be the key to his enduring power. His irony, his combination of the lowest with the highest. He may be plain and ugly on the outside, but on the inside he is, as Alcibiades claims, like a hollow statue, which opens and reveals that he is full of beauty in the images of gods. For me, this is the empire of the mind. So that's it. That's what the channel is about. I hope that gives you some more perspective on my methodology and intentions in my writing and the videos I make. Alexander Pope said that a perfect judge will read each work of wit with the same spirit that its author writ. And so I hope you'll be able to better discern the spirit in which I make the things that I make. Much of what I say here is not primarily meant to be agreed with, it's not meant to be persuasive per se, though that element is definitely present. Primarily my videos are meant to be myutic, offering the education that gives birth to new ideas in each person. I want to create experiences to be entered, and secondly to provoke something in you for your own benefit, even where you might disagree. Pope encouraged critics to survey the whole, nor seek slight faults to find, where nature moves and rapture warms the mind. I hope my videos move you and warm you with rapture. And to your all's credit, most of you, most of you do a pretty amazing job of overlooking individual faults in my videos and appreciating the whole. And for that, I'm deeply thankful. Sometimes I wake up and I still can't believe that anyone cares about anything that I have to say on the internet. And so, thank you all for watching, and it's always incredibly moving to me to see you guys down in the comments. Thank you for being here, and thank you for making YouTube a a great experience.